If you or someone you know is struggling with alcoholism or addiction, do not hesitate to reach out for help. You can find numerous free resources on our website, thebeginagainpodcast.com, and there are tons of resources and support networks available online, in person, or just a phone call away. You don't have to face this challenge alone. Welcome to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes. On the Begin Again Podcast, we delve into the inspiring journeys of individuals who have overcome alcoholism and addiction and emerged as true trailblazers in entrepreneurship, business, sports, and beyond. Through authentic, uplifting, and profound conversations with our guests, we aim to shatter the stigma surrounding addiction and demonstrate that recovery can be a catalyst for remarkable success, strength, and resilience. We firmly believe that by listening to these accounts, you will be empowered to unlock your own potential, instigate positive change in your life, and contribute to the creation of a better world. So, get ready to be inspired and embark on your own personal journey of growth with the Begin Again Podcast. Welcome back to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes, and joining me today is Michael Conklin of Better Beginning Now. Michael is a certified addiction recovery coach and a life coach who has been in recovery himself for over 15 years. His mission, which he found himself in recovery, is to help others realize that in sobriety, we are all capable of achieving far greater things than we could have ever imagined. Mike, how you doing, bud? Thanks for being here. Gary, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, I get chills, you know what I mean? Like when I hear that like that, because um, you and I were chopping it up a little bit just before we you know, went on here. And it is like, it, it's strange that we find this purpose in recovery. You know what I mean? I, I felt like I was always searching for something in my life. Just didn't, you know, am I allowed to curse here? Yo, I just yeah, didn't, yeah. I'm like, I just fun, didn't bro. fucking know what it was. You know what I mean? But I was always looking for something. Um, and it was always looking, I was always looking for something outside of me. Yeah. That's really what it was. And I think that, uh, I think that's the main thing with addiction. Like I, personally, I can only speak for myself, but I, I was always looking for something outside myself to fix the way that I was feeling inside. So 100%. I would take it and it would make me feel better. And then that feeling would last for a little bit. And then that feeling would be gone. And then the uncomfortability came back and then I found something else, you know, like my addiction was more. You know, like whatever, what do you got? Give me more. What do you, you know, what do you want? What do you got? How much, how much do you want? How much do you have? You know, like that was, that was me. So like I, I was always searching for something outside myself. And then when I got sober, you know, it really came down to putting down the drugs and the alcohol, you know, I had put down the drugs first and then alcohol was what brought me to my knees. And like when I put down the drink because of circumstances, you know, like, (laughs) whether it's, you you know, Oh, you got arrested or you're not allowed back in the house or things like that. But I wanted to get back in there. I would put it down. And, uh, the further away I got, I say this all the time, the further away I got from a drink, the faster the spinning was in my head and the tighter the knot was in my stomach. So -hmm. if alcohol is my problem and I'm not drinking, why is it the further away I am from it? You know, one week, two weeks, a month away from alcohol. Why am I so batshit crazy? Yes. Because I am walking around with untreated alcoholism. I needed to understand what that was. And it wasn't until I got into recovery that I understood what that was. I was fixing an internal problem with an external source. Absolutely. Anytime I'm doing that, I am playing around in the loop of addiction. So I can do that still. Like, right. I can do it without alcohol and drugs. You know, I can get all squirreled up inside and I can find something that'll fix that feeling. But mm-hmm. the reality is, is that I always have the ability to fix that feeling myself. You know, yes. what am I thinking about? Why are these thoughts making me feel this way? And it all starts with my head. It all starts with what I'm thinking, you know, and 99.9% of the time, my thoughts are just bullshit. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm fabricating these things. And, and if you are still drinking and still using those thoughts are absolutely irrational. You know, they are just completely irrational. My expectations are through the roof. You know, my, my thoughts of the past are like, oh, why this? Or why couldn't I have done that? Or like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, like the, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, and I had some really, really, really amazing people in the beginning of my recovery that literally they just didn't sugarcoat it. You know, they didn't co-sign my bullshit. They told mm-hmm. me straight up, you know, kind of how it was, you know, like, dude, a lot of your demise is your own making. I know that hurts, you know, because yep. here I am like, you know, like it's the world's problem. 
Yes. Everybody did this to me, right? If they didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. You know, yep. so I walked around with all these resentments, all these things, and I just blamed the world for my problems. And, you know, hey, the whole world's against you. It's not the whole world. Right. Amen to all you just said. And, you know, I, I had that sort of epiphany on resentments, too, in, in recovery. You know, like I had this massive chip on my shoulder. And if you had gone through what I had gone through and if you had saw what I saw when I was a kid and this and people in my house and drugs and this stuff when I was a kid, you'd be worse than I am, you know. And But it dawned on me one day, like it was told to me in the rooms, too, like, Gary, listen, like, yeah, maybe some of this stuff is, is true. And, you know, maybe it's all true. But here's what you need to realize, like the only person right now that this is affecting is you. And so you can choose to hold on to this for the rest of your life and you can be a miserable fuck your whole life and go nowhere. Or you can come to peace with it and make amends if you have to. And when you do that whole process and, and the resentments are removed, you're free. And everything I learned, it took me so long to get there too, though, Mike, like even in recovery, like some of those deep resentments and some of those deep ones I had, it took me so long to actually go through them, even though I had them written down on a piece of paper and I shared them with someone else, you know, when you get to the process of making amends and stuff, you know, I still held them, you know, I still, it's also part of who I am. Like this, this little chip on my shoulder, it started when I was a kid and it's still there. He's just a little tamer these days or more that's, aware of him. <laughs> you know, that, but, that's a hundred percent true. Like I can relate to everything you just said. Like, it is so true that you know, I, I said something the other day, like, you know, like res resentments, holding resentments is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yeah. And that's it right there. Like they don't even know you have the resentment against them, you know, they but here I am. No, right. Yeah. Here I am carrying this around for, you know, months, years, decades, you know, like this yes. deep seated resentment for what? Like it's not affecting anybody but me. You know, and some of that, like you said, too, like some of that stuff was really hard to let go of. Yes. And I needed the help of other people to get me to the point of saying, like, you got to let this go, you know, and I was able to do that over time. I was able to do that. And there were some, you know, this one, this one I want to hold on to for a little while. It's like, OK, when you're ready, how free do you want to be? Right. How free do you want to be? Exactly. Because if you start feeling good. As you're making these amends, as you're owning your shit in that in that situation, granted, some situations in my life, I didn't know anything. Right. And it was I had I want to I don't want to say a valid reason to feel the way that I did. But the things that happened. Yeah, I, I was you know, it was it affected me emotionally. And that's that's life. Right. Things are going to continue to happen that are going to affect me emotionally. But it doesn't mean that. I need to carry a resentment against a person. I can just say like, look, that is a sick individual. They, they know not what they do yeah. and they're going to have to deal with that themselves someday, but I don't have to deal with it. You know, I don't have to carry it with me. I don't need to carry the burden of their mistakes. You know, and that's what I think I did a lot of times too. I tried to carry the burden of the world. Yeah. I love what you said too. Cause I'm a total believer that, you know, my alcoholism and addiction for me, alcoholism, first and foremost, it led to everything. I was alcoholic from the jump, from the get-go. But it was it was me trying to feel better on the outside when I had this soul sickness and insecurity and fear on the inside. Like, And I didn't even know it. I, I didn't realize what, like the word childhood anxiety, like I didn't learn that till like, you know, in recovery. And then some of the resentments we're talking about, like these are things that like my, I had a very like active dad and there was always stuff in the house and, you know, cut straws from cocaine the night before, like stupid shit, like eight year old aren't supposed to get, you know, see when they're going to get a spoon for their Cheerios, you know? And, <laughs> but, you know, so I held this on, I held this like in my back pocket, like my whole life chip, whatever you want to call it. And then, so when I was, you know, same thing, you mentioned all, all, all the above, arrests, trouble, all of them, salt, DWI, salt and police officer, like, you know, the whole thing, 16 years old, waking up Thanksgiving morning, salt, salt for assault of a police officer, broke cops nose in a fight. Like, this is where it took me, right? Uh, at a young age, quickly, you know, um, but um, the resentments uh, I was saying is, you know, I held on, like, it was almost, if I look back, like, 
really look at it like it was my identity. Like it was who exactly. I was. These resentments really ran my whole life as a young guy and going into adulthood. And I say this too about adulthood, like Mike, I got so first time I went to rehab, I was 26 years old. I sobered last time I had a drink, I was 31. And I say this a lot. Like I was maybe an adult in stature and, you know, if we pass, you know, but inside I was a scared little shitless kid, even yeah. at 31 years old. And it wasn't until I found sobriety that I started working on what we're talking about on the inside and who I am. And it was my identity also, my party or party guy, maniac, you know, watch out for him. Good guy, but you never know what's going to happen. You know, all of it, you know. Uh, and again, those are on the good days, you know, that's before all the got really dark. But you start working on yourself, you know, like I had friends that are starting to, you know, start families and we're married and they had a house and they had nice cars. And I had this, you know, I'm still driving the old shit boxes I have from my high school. And like, I wasn't going anywhere and I had apps, I was going nowhere. And it wasn't until I got, you know, sober that, you know, I started working on myself and things started turning around for me. But, uh, you know, those are the things we learn. Right. And this is the, I was just talking about this with somebody else too, which I love. Like, this is the journey. This is the path I'm on now. Like, there's no finish line. Like there's like, I'm not trying to get somewhere. Like I'm not trying to like graduate to something like that. All those terms, when I first came in that, you know, I didn't want to hear anything about, or they made no sense. Like, you know, I wish you a long, slow recovery. It's like, what the <laughs> f are you talking about? Like, yeah, fuck you. I don't want a long, slow. Yeah, I, want I want this, this shit work. done. Yeah. I want quick. this done. Let's I want to go. feel better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, but now I know what that means, right? Yeah. I'll fuck that guy. I'm not sitting people. next to him. I'm not sitting next to him. <laughs> exactly, he wished me a long, slow recovery. Yeah, Jesus. What the fuck's his problem? <laughs> I remember when I, I remember like the first, like, newcomers like beginners meeting that i went to um you know they go around the room everybody yeah. shares their sobriety date and there was probably about like 20 people in the meeting that day you know and like they're going yeah. around and everybody's sharing their you know and i'm i'm doing the math you know they're giving their sobriety date. i'm like all right that guy's five years sober she's 10 years sober he's 20 fucking 30 years sober yep. you know two years i'm like my instant thought was why the fuck are they still coming here why yeah. are they, they don't get it. Like, there's no way that I'm going to still be coming to this shit. And I, I'm going to figure that I'm going to get this right. 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 Like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, so I don't good. have to come to these forever. Like, look, I'll, I'll, I'll get the program. I'll do what you're telling you asking me to do. And then I'll be good. Right? right. Like, I don't need to come here. These people are crazy to want to come here, but like, it's, it's like you said, it's just, it's a journey and it's part of the process. And it, there's no goal. You know, right. what I learned after some time, was that like it it makes me a better person not only for myself but when i'm a better person for myself i'm just a better person to everyone around me yeah you know and when you become like that like you literally like i remember a gentleman said it's like you become like a magnet you know and i understand that now like you know like we attract into our lives what we are you mm -hmm. know and i literally lived by the mantra that the world is full of assholes. I'm just living in it. Like that is how I thought when I was drinking, like everybody is just an asshole. Like, why is it, you know, but then come yeah. to realize like, maybe I was just so disgruntled, so full of fear. You know, it's like you said, I never, when I was drinking, I never thought of myself as being fearful, no, frightened, but that's exactly what I was. I did everything because I was just either afraid that I wouldn't get what I wanted or I would lose what I already had. So that just kept me stuck. And then like you said, I loved what you said, like that resentment that I carried around in my back pocket, those, those things that I held on to, like that bag of rocks that I carried yeah. around with me literally was my identity. It was who I became. It was who I was. It's like that. Then when it came time to get sober, I think my like that's when fear really hit me and I felt it was who are you going to become? Yeah. This is all you've ever known. Like, what are you supposed to do now? Like that's, that's when fear struck me and I felt it. I was like, fuck, you yeah. know, but what I didn't realize is like the way that I was living my life was not serving me. And it was definitely not serving the people around me, you know? And like, if I wanted more out of life, or if I just wanted to continue to live, then I needed to do things differently, you know, and then the process begins.
right? right? And scary, you know, yes, like, but oh my God, it's like you said, like, you know, like when you do that first amends, there's just this like, that felt pretty good. You yeah. know, that was, that felt nice. I want to do another one, you know, yeah. and like, and then, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't know, like, you know, like some programs say like, you know, as, <laughs> as the, you know, like, it's kind of like, you know, more is revealed. And then like each and every one that I did, I continued to feel better and better. Yes. So like, and it was explained to me like, okay, so why would you stop here? Like, yes, some of these are going to be hard, but you have felt this relief with each and every one you've done, right? You'll be amazed before you're halfway through. Like those mm -hmm. kinds of things like really hit me because I'm like, I've only done like three of these and I'm right. feeling pretty good. And that's where we can kind of like hold back. That's where we can all of a sudden say like, we pump the brakes and we're like, you know what? I did three. I'm feeling a lot better than I did before. So <laughs> I don't really think it's necessary that we go through the rest of them. And then comes the person in that's, you know, not co-signing my bullshit and says, okay, how free do you want to be? You want to stop with those three and you want these other five, eight, 10 that you have to make come back and bite you in the ass. Cause they will, they're yeah. not going anywhere. Right. They'll eventually, they might not be eating at you right now, but I can promise you, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night one night. And the one of these is going to be eating you alive. No doubt. Fuck, you know? No and then it's just like, Oh, why do you got to say that? Cause he's <laughs> right. And that's what we need in our life. If any, if people, if when I was ready to get sober and stay sober, what I needed in my life was somebody that was going to be willing to tell me the truth, somebody that I trusted, somebody that had been through this process before, and that was going to kind of not take me along, but just kind of guide me in my own journey, like Absolutely. guide me. That's yeah. what I needed. I needed a guide, you know, and you can call it, a, you can call it a sponsor. You can call it a mentor. You can call it a coach. You can call it a fucking best friend in recovery. Somebody that's walked a path before you, you know, and what I've learned in life is that I can use that same idea, those same tactics, those same strategies in all facets of life, whether it's business, family, relationships, people that have done it before me, go and ask five people, what did you do? How did you do that? There'll be more than most of the time, people will be more than willing to tell you how they did it, it's whether it's up to you, whether or not you're going to take the actionable steps to actually do it. And if you do it, you will get the results. I couldn't agree more. And you taught, you're touching upon practicing these principles in all of our affairs. Yeah. Right. And I was looking over your stuff and I, I agree with everything that like you're about your whole thing is, you know, what did we read at the beginning? Your mission is, is to help others realize that in sobriety, we're capable of achieving far greater things than we ever could have imagined. And I am an absolute firm, firm, strong believer in that statement. Because I'm one of them, you know, and if I'm in here, anything's possible. Like I can listen, I'm a human. I'll go down the rabbit hole too. Like he had said fear, right? Like, and just like you had said, like when I was out there, like I, I never, if there was the word, for, you know, I think you would have thought I was the least, you know, I wasn't afraid of anything. That's how I went out. Like I wasn't afraid of anything. I did all the stupid stuff. I did all the crazy stuff. I got an awful lot of trouble, you know? And when I finally got sober, you know, that's when, that's when you really realize fear. And like I said, I was, I didn't realize I was a scared little child it's on the inside, you know, but all this false bravado that I put out on the outside and, you know, to the point where I'm, you know, multiple arrests for assaults, like paints a pretty picture for everybody to see though. Yeah. But it's a, it's a fraud. It's a fake, Yeah, exactly. You know, but yep. like you had also said, you know, there comes a time, at least for me, where like, you know, I can say I'm not that guy, but actions speak louder than words, man. And like, this is right now, this is who you are, you know, whether you like it or not, whether you want to face it or admit it or not, but that's who I was, you know, for sure. And then fear. I love the foot fear of false expectations appearing real. You know, if I look at the word, I could put my, I could put my finger on the word fear and like almost anything. If I really let myself go down the rabbit hole, but I'm aware of it now, but all of my fears are projections into the future if what if this happens or what if that happens and it comes back to the to this you know the saying like dude like where are you right now you're exact gary you're exactly where you're supposed to be right now and mike you and i right now are exactly where we're supposed to be we're supposed to be talking about this stuff right now right and yeah. i think that's where the higher purpose and the higher power comes in and 
we don't realize it, you know, like yeah. looking forward to speaking to you before we jump on and now we're in it. And I'm like, I'm just full of gratitude because we're on the same exact page and all this. And, you know, we, we both realize how important it is and, you know, it's a blessing. It's a beautiful thing, but you know, so let me ask you, how old were you when you old, when you first started realizing or people started pointing out or you started getting in trouble, like what led you to the pet part where, you know, you need to change things up. So I started drinking like, I don't know how old I was when I like had my first drinks of alcohol. I was probably a toddler because I either like, you know, steal sips off my grandfather's highball or like when I was growing up, you know, everybody had the refrigerator in the basement that was full of like Miller, you know, high lives and, you know, uh, you know, Jenny cream ale nips, you know, so the kids would run down, grab another beer for the parents, you know, bring it upstairs, you know, we'd sneak down, you know, drink off of them ourselves. But I do know the first time that I ever got drunk with the intent of getting drunk, I was nine. You know, we stole a bottle of wild turkey off of my, you know, my friend's kitchen sink. We, you know, hopped on the trike and drove it down to the backfield and just passed it back and forth until I puked my brains out. And then I blacked out for the first time when I was 11. And then I kind of drank that way straight on through my career of drinking. Um, I remember being like, I remember being like, and I would drink on the weekends, you know what I mean? Like, you know, partying on the weekends, you know, breaking to the church basement, you know, stuff like that. Like, uh, you know, in the summers they would have this, like the church auction and we'd go, they'd sent this big, they'd set this big tent up like the week before for the auction. So we would go and climb up on the tent and slide on the tent, just doing dumb shit. Like as young kids, you know, like 10, 11, 12 years old. And then by the time that I was in like, you know, middle school, you know, now I'm like, now I had blacked out. Now I'm like drinking on the weekends and I drank for the effect produced by alcohol. I didn't drink because I thought it like, yes, I guess I thought it made me cool. Cause I was hanging out with the older kids and stuff, but I drank because I like to get fucked up. Yeah. And then I remember I was about 16 years old and it was like the day after my grandparents lived right up the road. And I used to go up there on the weekends and like mow the lawn for my, you know, with my grandfather and my grandmother would make you know, it would make me lunch, you know, while I was mowing with him and stuff. <laughs> and I remember my grandfather, it was like the day after a family picnic. We used to have like this family picnic every year and like maybe a couple of them every year or whatever. Maybe somebody was retiring, stuff like that. And sure. it was like the day after family picnic. And I had been drinking at the family picnic, you know, 16. And my grandfather said to me while we were mowing the lawn, he didn't say it like, you know, he he wasn't rude about it. He wasn't like, you know, you need to knock that shit off. He just said, and I'll never forget this. And it didn't hit me then, but he said, Bob, you got to be really careful Mm -hmm. with the way you drink. He goes, because when you, when you start, you can see it in your eyes. Mm -hmm. Once you start, you're ready to go. And I had no, I get chills, but I had no idea what he meant then, but I fucking know what he means now. Yeah. The second that I start, I'm off to the races. Like it's go time and there is no off switch. Like I would just go (laughs) and like he recognized it. And then like later on in life, like him and I, you know, being a grown man and sober and like just kind of talking and learning more about what his life was like when he came back, you know, he spent three and a half years in the South Pacific. He never really talked about that until like, you know, after my grandmother passed and then he like started talking, you know, he recorded a lot of stuff on tapes and like, you know, I was watching like a, a a series the other day and it was all about like world war two and like, you know, and it's about the South Pacific and I'm like thinking to myself like, wow, he went through a lot of shit, yeah you know, like, and, and I, he recognized that in me because I had learned later on, like when he came back from overseas, he literally, I remember him telling me this story. He said, every day was Friday and Saturday was New Year's Eve. That's how he partied. He yeah. said, every day was, you know, every day was Friday and and, and fr- Saturday was New Year's Eve. So he said, and then I met your grandmother and he, he kind of was coming home from like one of the like VFW halls or something one night. And he said there was a few gals standing outside. So he pulled up and said, you girls need a ride home. And he's like, I knew two of them. I didn't know the other one, which ended up being your grandmother. (laughs) He goes, but I drove them all home. And she happened to be the last one I dropped off because she was on the way to the house. And then she said, you know, we're going to be here tomorrow night if you'd like to come. 
And he's, that was it. They kind of like, that's where their relationship started. And she told my grandfather, she said, if you keep partying around the way you are, want to be the town drunk, she goes, we will not be together. Yeah. And he said, it just kind of hit him that he was like, I can't keep partying like this. And he did that for like a year when he first came back, you know, cause he was just happy to be home. But I think he recognized in me, like, look, you keep going down, you keep doing what you're doing. You're going to hit roadblocks big time in your life, you know? And none of that, like, it wasn't enough to stop me then. And then by the time I was in my, like my late teens, early twenties, you know, then I had a, you know, I, I was drinking a lot, a lot. Um, and then like, you know, I had a, you know, my, you know, my, my girlfriend and I, at the time we had a baby, you know, I was 20, 21 when, you know, when she got pregnant, 22, when, when my daughter was born, um, we had a second child, you know, two years later, you know, we stayed together. She put up with a lot of my shit, you know, with drinking. Um, and then we got married after, you know, Noah was a couple years old. I think he was two at the time, like two, like a little over. Well, no, let's see. He was. Yeah, Noah was two. So Noah was a little over two years old. And then, you know, we'd gotten married. So we got a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and then we have, you know, another child, you know, like in February. So we got three kids. I'm 27 years old. I'm still drinking. She's still putting up with my bullshit. And I'm like, I'm, we're just, I'm just living. I'm just surviving life. I yeah. love my kids. I love my family, but I'm still a fuck up, you yeah. know, and I'm always, and somehow I was, I was just still fucking up and I didn't see it. You know what I mean? It was hard for me to see because I'm, I'm living life. We're doing stuff. You know, I deserve to be able to do this. I'm raising three kids. I got a roof over the head. What's the problem? Yeah. And that's really how I viewed things, you know, like what's the problem. And it was not, nothing was enough to stop me. Like, you know, the, there were times where I stopped drinking intermittently for, because I fear sobered me up for a bit, fear sure. of loss, losing your family you know, you get, or getting arrested, waking up in a hospital, things like that. And it's like, God, what are you doing? You yeah. know, so many people said it, like, what is wrong with him? Like, he's got a good life. You know, he's got, got a beautiful family. Like what, why can't he just stop? If he just stopped drinking, everything in his life would be, he'd have a great life. Right. And that's like alludes back to what we were talking about. It, I stopped, but I couldn't understand. Like when I stopped drinking, um, the further away I get from the drink, the faster the spinning is in my head and the tighter the knot is in my stomach. Like, what mm -hmm. the fuck? Yeah. Like, if drinking is my problem, shouldn't these problems go away? Right. They didn't. But I didn't understand that I was just walking around with untreated alcoholism. I didn't have a solution to that internal problem that I had my whole life. That just constant uncomfortability that just dwelled inside of me because of shit that I had carried around with me my whole life. And until I was ready to deal with that stuff, I was going to continue to feel the way that I felt, you know, and it wasn't until I was, you know, 33 years old that I got into recovery. Like, and I, I went away to a rehab, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, so what changed everything for me, what changed everything was a year leading up to going to rehab, like I had been tiptoeing around the rooms of AA. Mm. Now I had gone to AA because my, my wife and I at the time were in like therapy. Like we were going to, you know, marriage counseling because things were not good. You know what sure. I mean? Like they just weren't good, but I liked counseling because I was right. Sometimes like the counselor took my side. So it felt good. I'm like, <laughs> see, I'm not always wrong, but I still was drinking. And then I remember one day, um, the marriage counselor had said to me, she's like, why don't you just try AA? And I'm like, not going to AA. I had family members that had gone to AA. I'm like, not happening. I'm like, they talk about God there. I don't want anything to do with it. No, no, thank you. And like, after being persistent, you know, over the course of time, she was like, you know, why don't you just try it? I said, you know what? Fine. I'll fucking try it. And I was like, I'll go tomorrow. Right. She goes, well, actually reaches back, grabs a pamphlet and she goes, there happens to be a meeting tonight over at the brick church. If you left now, you could probably still make it. So I'm like, Oh, fine. Being the stubborn alcoholic that I am, I'll fucking prove you wrong. I'll right. go. Right. So sure. I go to this meeting 
And I know where the brick church is because that's the church that I went to as a small child. That's the church that we broke into the basement. That's the church that we were fucking sliding down on, you know, as young, you know, idiotic kids, like just doing stupid shit. So I knew where it was and I knew where the basement was. So I went to this meeting. So I sit down. Tables are kind of set up in a horseshoe. The basement's old. The church is like from like the, you know, 17, 1800s. Musty smelling down there. And the, the tables are set up in a horseshoe. And I sit at the top corner, you know, of the horseshoe. I'm just sitting there. There's this guy sitting next to me. And he's like, hey, how you doing? Name's John. I'm like, hey, Mike. You know, and he's like, nice to meet you. I'm like, yeah, nice to meet you too. So he's like, uh, what are you doing here? I'm like, I've, I've never been to a meeting before. He's like, never? I said, no. This is my very first meeting that I've ever been. At. He's like, oh, it's a big book meeting. I go, I have no idea what that fucking means. I'm like, I have no idea. So he's like, oh, th- dude, simple, man. Listen, there's going to be a couple people. They're going to sit up in the front. He's like, they're going to do some stuff in the beginning. They're going to like, you know, goes and then like when we start the meeting, they're going to go around the room. They're going to read. He goes and when, it, you know, we're going to read from the big book. And he's like that book right in front of you. It's like, okay. He's like, and when it gets to you, you can either, you can either read or you can just say pass. You don't have to. Read. I said, oh, okay, great. Right. So it gets around to me. And this is where it was. How my wife kept her faith and courage during all those years, I'll never know, but she did. If she had not, I know I would have been dead a long time ago. For some reason, we alcoholics seem to have the gift of picking out the world's finest women. Why they should be subjected to the tortures we inflict upon them, I cannot explain. Pass. I was like, holy, are you fucking kidding me? So I was like, okay, something's going on here. Okay, like, okay. I'm not a religious or God fearing person whatsoever. Right. That's going to be the fucking passage that I read that lands on you it lands on me. Right. So I'm like, okay. So then I leave that meeting for the next year. I kind of like tiptoe around the rooms of AA, you know, I, uh, I have it drinking here and there, but I'm going to a meeting or two here and there. I don't do anything. I don't get, I don't really talk to people, I talk to some people like that, you know, seem to be hanging out outside after where, you know, before, yeah. you know, I knew somebody there, one of my friend's dads was at the meeting. So I kind of like, but I still drank, tiptoed around, didn't get a sponsor, didn't get into any steps, didn't read like any literature. I didn't do shit. Like I was just like kind of keeping the fire off my ass at home. And after about a year of doing that, I wanted to jump off a bridge. Like yeah. I wanted to die. Because I was so uncomfortable inside. Like, I just couldn't understand. Like, I'm going to these fucking meetings. You know, I'm not drinking. I'm only drinking on occasion. You know, like, why do I still feel this way? And just about a year, like, almost like a year to the day, like, after starting going to meetings, I am completely sideways in my life. And I don't want to live. And my mom kind of hears this and she's like, you know, my wife told, you know, my wife at the time says like, you need to get out. Like you can't be here. Right. And I go to my mom's, I tell my mom how I like, and she's beside herself. No parent ever wants to hear their child. Like kind of say, no matter how old they are, they don't want to live. So she's like, you know, you need to do something like, would you go away? And I was like, yeah, I would. And I like, I kind of was like, I I need to do something. So, right took a couple days to get me a bed. Mm-hmm. I end up. So once I admit that I, like, I'm like, okay, I'll go. Yeah. So here I am for a couple of days. I'm researching some rehabs. <laughs> I'm looking at these beautiful fucking places in Malibu, you know, <laughs> like, Oh, there's a really nice place in like the Adirondacks. There's a nice place. Oh, this one's nice. This is on a lake yeah. like near the Poconos. Oh, this one's down in Florida. So I'm like looking at all these places. My mom gets me in to Bon Secours Hospital in Port Jervis, New York. And I'm on the, I am on the third floor MICA unit. So I am intertwined with, you know, mental illness, alcoholics, addicts. This is not what I fucking signed up for is what yeah. I'm thinking. You know, right. I remember getting to the rehab that day. The nurse that checked me in, like when I sat outside for like two and a half hours waiting to get checked in brings me back, does my blood work, does piss test. And he asked me, he's like going through the questionnaire and he's like, so when's the last time you drank? So I was like, ah, I don't know, a couple days ago. He's like, when is the last time you drank? 
I said this morning, he goes, there you fucking go. Maybe mm-hmm. for once in life, you want to start being honest. Yeah. He's like, you're here now. Why right. don't you try to make the best of this? Yeah. Because I went to see our therapist the morning of, and I literally like just told her what I was doing, where I, where I was going. I was going to go try to get away and try to make, you know, figure this out. I was like, I want to make this work. And I literally stopped at the gas station, got some beer for my drive back to the house. You know, then my mom and I had lunch. I went to the rehab, get checked in, taking the elevator up. Same nurse says to me, he goes, I want you to remember why you're here. I was like, what? He goes, remember why you're here. He goes, when you wake up tomorrow, because it was late by the time I got checked in, he goes, when you wake up tomorrow, there is a lot of bullshit in there. Mm -hmm. Don't get involved in the bullshit. Remember why you're here. This is your recovery. You need to like, if you take this seriously, it's going to be up to you what you do with this. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So a couple of days go by in rehab. Um, It's not the place I want to be. I really want out of this place. And mm-hmm. every day I am fucking on the phone with my mom and saying, this place doesn't have what I need. This isn't like, this isn't the place for me. I haven't seen my therapist yet. I'm supposed to see the psychiatrist, yada, 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 you know? And uh, it was February 12th is the day that I went in. February 17th, I'm on the phone with my then four-year-old son. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the phone and my son says, hey, dad, you're going to be at my birthday party tomorrow, right? He's Mm -hmm. like, I was like, I don't know, bud, because my kids think I'm working. He's like, no, 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 you're going to be there. You know where it's at. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you at my birthday party because it's the day before his fifth birthday. Right. And there is a birthday party for him with friends and family. And I'm on the phone and I'm telling this fucking innocent four-year-old child, I don't know if I'm going to be there, bud. Yeah. And I got off the phone and I walked into my room and I hit my knees mm-hmm. and I was fucking broken because that was the very first time in my life that I realized that not only was my disease my alcoholism my addiction affecting just me because that's what i believed right it was having a direct effect on not just people that loved me but people that i loved most in the world yeah and i i i i hit my knees i was like bawling i literally just opened my mouth and like because i had tiptoed around the rooms i heard what they read every day i heard god could and what if he were sought I brought a big book with me and I literally was like, I don't know if what you are, who you are. I have no idea. I'm like, but I I literally, what came out of my mouth in that moment was every person I had ever wronged, everything I had ever done wrong in my life came out of my mouth. And I just said, I don't know how to do this. I need help. If there is anything that you can do to help me, I will do everything I possibly can to stay sober. Everything that I can. And I just felt better. Like I literally stood up, the fucking tears dried up, and I just felt like the weight of the world was off of me. And I haven't drank. Like there have been lots of reasons in my life since then to drink, but I haven't found one good enough to drink. You know, and like I I literally, and then there's a knock on my fucking door after this all happens, because I've been trying to get out of this place, there's a knock on my door and it's a nurse. And she's like, there's a phone call for you. It's your mom. So I'm like, great. So I get on the phone with my mom and my mom's like, what's up? I'm like, nothing. What's going on, mom? She's like, I think I got a, I, I, I can come get you tomorrow. I got a bed for you at another rehab. Mm-hmm. And I was like, nah, mom, it's okay. And she's like, what do you mean? She's like, I'm like, it's okay. Everything is fine. And she's like, you are you okay and i'm like mom i have never been better yeah i said i am going to stay right where i am she's like i don't understand i said neither do i neither do i and i stayed and i only got to stay there 10 days because my insurance wouldn't pay for 28 days which is another big fucking bullshit scam like it's yeah the whole it needs to be fixed because here i was i wanted to stay I couldn't stay. The insurance basically said the way that the hospital explained it to me, I sat down with administration and I sat down with my psychiatrist and they were like, here's what we can do. We right. can give you 10 days, but if we can give you 
IOP, intensive outpatient. And if you fail at IOP, then we can bring you back in for a full 28 day. Ridiculous. So like, are you fucking kidding me? And like that, it burns me like to know that this is what happens, especially now being in recovery for a while that you have a person with a window of opportunity that wants to stay, that wants to get sober. And then you're going to push them away. You're going to tell them to go out and fail and then they can right. come back. Do you know how many people don't make it back? Like, that's the problem, you know? So I was like, and I did like my path worked out the way it did for a reason, right? Like I got out of rehab. I literally went home. My, my, my wife at the time picked me up, um, went home that night. It was snowing. Got a huge snowstorm the next day. It was like 17 inches of snow. I kind of just shoveled that night. I shoveled out the next morning. It was a Sunday. And I went to it. Like I was looking at a pamphlet. I had like, I got to go to a meeting. Didn't go Saturday because we were snowed in. Sunday, I went to a meeting. I was leaving that meeting and it was a speaker meeting. So nobody shared, just the speakers. And on my way out the door, this man approached me and stopped me. And he was like, hey. I was like, hey. He's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, um, just got out of rehab Friday night. And he's like, oh, he's like, poor wife, why are you here? I said, I, I don't want to drink anymore. Yeah. You know? And uh, he had me read a little paragraph out of the out of the book. You know, he's like, here, I want you to read this. And basically it's, you know, it's anybody wants to look it up. It's page 44. First paragraph kind of says, if and when you, you know, you drink, you find that you can't control the amount you intake you know, you take in, or if you're craving alcohol when you're not drinking, you might suffer from, you might be an alcoholic, you know, and if you suffer from this, you know, as some of us do, you know, only a spiritual experience will, will work. Yep. And I ended up talking to that man and I went to two more meetings that night with that man. And I got surrounded by people in this program, you know, in, in the program that just kind of live it and like, we're living fucking, they were happy. They were like, fucking, I was like, wow, this is cool. You yeah. know, like these people are happy. Like this is, I, this is weird. I remember asking him too. I was like, well, how long have you been sober? You know? And his answer to me was a couple days. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, and I get it now because it, it doesn't matter. Like it, it's not about the amount of time that you're sober. No, it's about not, the, what are you doing with it? What kind of experience life. are you having in your life today? You know? And then he, he, you know, he hammered that stuff home to me. And like, you know, I got, I had really, really strong sobriety, you know, for like five years. Stay really connected. All the blessings came true. You know what I mean? Yep. All the promises came true. I got back tenfold what I had lost. And so much came back that I kind of like, just, I didn't have time. I didn't have yeah. time to stay connected anymore. I was good. You know, I'm five years sober. I'm good. And, um, you know, like three, four meetings a week became once a week, became once every other week, became once a month became quarterly meetings is what I like to call them became, I saw somebody in the store today and we said, hello, I'm good. You're still, you know, like, how yeah. are you doing? I'm good. You right, know what right. I mean? Like, <laughs> and, and I went on like that for like the next five years and I had, I was busy. Business was good. We were busy and I just didn't have time. And at like 10 years sober, um, you know, my wife at the time, like, you know, that was it. Like we had kind of, I didn't see it because I was so busy but we had just really grown apart. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, basically it was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I was floored, like floored. Like I just did, I didn't know what to do. I hadn't felt that uncomfortable since drinking. Yeah. And I was so twisted. And I remember calling up like my sponsor and I'm like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> and he's like, what she does is none of your business. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? what are you talking about? That's my wife and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he's like, you're not listening to me. What she does, is none of your business. He's like, this is not about, this is not about her. What have you done? You need to get to a meeting. I'm like, I already fucking went. I went three days ago. I've been going to meetings for three days. He's like, great. I might fucking suggest you go to another one. He yeah. goes, and then if I were you, I would start working with somebody else. He goes, you need to start working with someone else. And I said, I know, I know. And that's what really it is. It's getting outside myself. Fucking stop thinking so much about it. It's, it's my problems, my problems, my problems. Right. It's in service of others that I kind of get outside myself. And that was in, uh, that was in September, September of 2018. And mm -hmm. like, I got reconnected and I've stayed reconnected and, you know, and, and my life is great today. Like, it's not always like, is it always sunshine and rainbows? And, you know, no, it is not. No. But it, I do know, like, 
it what's crazy is that we we can like I knew that those first five years of sobriety, it was sobriety and recovery that brought all of those blessings into my life. Mm. And then like, because I'm a human being, like to think that it was me that did all of these things, I stray away from it. And what happens? I lose again, you know? And that's why, like, I tell people all the time, like, look, I'm first thing on my gratitude list every day is my sobriety and my recovery. Yep. You no. Know? And then usually it's my kids, you know, and then it can be something as simple as a cup of coffee. You know, it could be something like tomorrow I can, you know, tomorrow it'll be this conversation that I got to have with Gary, you know, like I have to put it first because if I'm not sober and if I'm not participating in my recovery, everything else that comes below it, I will lose. And I know I will because I proved it to myself. And I heard people say that before and I kind of thought they were crazy. You know, like, oh, how can you put your sobriety in your recovery ahead of your kids? You know, because my kids wouldn't be a part of my life the way that they are if I wasn't so, yep. you know, and I learned that this summer, no, last year, like my, my, I was in Colorado at the time and my daughter and my son-in-law came out to visit and we were just having like brunch and, um, we were just talking about somebody and like saying like, oh, you know, he's kind of struggling again. He's not, he's kind of drinking and he thinks he can handle it type thing. Right. And I said to my daughter and I was like, you know, I don't. I just don't know if I'd be able to look at you guys if I ever drank again. And immediately she said, you wouldn't. I was like, fuck. Oh, and that to me, I would never want to see the disappointment in my kids faces. If I drank like, so I stay sober because a it's provided me with a life beyond my wildest dreams. Sounds crazy. I remember people telling me that in the beginning and be like, yeah, okay. Beyond my wildest dreams. Like, no, no, no. Yep. It is true. We yep. learn to just handle life differently. Sure. And when we handle life differently, it's ups and downs. Like my grandfather used to say, Bub, you can't go through, you know, life's going to be full of peaks and valleys. You can't get to the peak unless you go through the valley. You're going to be ups and downs all the time. You keep, you know, and it, what the problem was while drinking is that I never learned from the mistakes. I never learned anything in those lows to be able to apply you know, it was, I continued to repeat the same mistakes over and over because I never learned the lesson. Recovery taught me how to learn the lesson, taught me how to be present in moments and actually see mm -hmm. what's going on to be able to handle what do I need to do next? Like you said it earlier, like I was so trapped in the past or my expectations of the future were so like grand or like just so far out there. Like I never, like I was never in the moment and that's yeah. all. And like, took me a while to realize that what I really was trying to do the entire time that I was drinking and drugging was I was just trying to get out of right here, right now. Yeah. I just didn't want to be here, whatever that meant. Like, I just didn't want to be in this moment. Like just yep. fucking take me somewhere else. The, the, the present moment is too uncomfortable. 100%. It doesn't have to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. That changed the trajectory of my life. You know, it's brought me to where I am today. It's brought me to this conversation. You know, like one of the best advice I was ever given was in rehab. This guy, Tony, he was, he came in like on a daily basis from, from, you know, from the rooms. He used to come in just like talk with people and stuff. And I was spinning. I was fucking like, I just come out of my meeting with my psychiatrist and the psychiatrist was like, uh, he's like, how'd that go? And I was like, great. I said, he just gave me a fucking prescription for anxiety and depression. He goes, huh? You ever been diagnosed with anxiety or depression before? said no he goes hmm. he had a conversation with that guy for 40 minutes he goes and he gave you he goes listen i'm not saying that you don't suffer from anxiety and depression i'm right. not he goes well, what i am saying is, is like do you think maybe you're feeling a little anxious right now because you're sitting in a place that is completely foreign to you you are what are you three four days now away from alcohol you are away from your family you are away from your job. You have no idea what's going to happen when you get out of here. Do you think maybe that might play into your anxiety and your depression? I go, I'm not telling you not to fill that prescription. He goes, what I am telling you is maybe just give it a little time. Maybe when you get out of here, you talk to your doctor. Yeah. You give it a little time and you see how you're feeling. He goes, because that may take you someplace you don't really want to go right now. Wow. And I listened to him. I yeah. did not fucking fill it. <laughs> Because if I, I know what would have, I was psyched. I was like, yes, I'm going to fucking escape. 
I'm going to yep. go take this prescription and I'm going to feel, ooh, wah. Yep. And I'm glad that I didn't. And he said to me, he goes, why don't you just take a look down? It's like, what? He goes, take a look down. He goes, okay. I'm like, okay. He goes, what do you see? I go, my feet. He goes, that's where you are right now. Mm -hmm. You are right where your feet are. He goes, cool. and that's where you will be the rest of your life. You will always be right where your feet are. And that is a really good way to kind of like when things are spinning to just kind of fucking take a second, look down and be like, you know what? There isn't a gun to my head. I'm not fucking, you know what I mean? Like I, things are okay right now. In the grand scheme of things, are there some things that I need to take care of? There are some things that I need to do. Absolutely. What do I need to do? Let's write it down. Let's get some actionable steps on paper right now. Let's look what, what got me here. That's the process of recovery is being able to look at my life, dissect it and say, how do I move forward from here? Not run away, not pull the covers over my head, not drown it, actually fucking deal with what's going on in my life. And in doing that, we get to live a great life. Amen. Amen. I mean, there, there is so much wisdom there and everything you had said from the gift to being able to speak to your grandfather just seems like just such a man full of wisdom. You know, I have both of my grandfathers were two vets, both were in the Navy. One was a, a boxer in the Pacific fleet and then one of the aircraft carriers. He was the, the champ of the Pacific fleet, I think it was called. And, um, you know, and I'm just sitting here and I'm listening to this amazing story that you had just told us. And it's just a story full of spirituality and of higher purpose and a higher power in your life. Right. Like you can't, and I don't know how to put a finger on any of this either, but I hear it Mike over and over and over again, especially on this journey of podcasting I've been on is that we hit this, this moment in our lives. And like your moment is when you went back into that room and you, and you went to your knees and you asked God for help. And as soon as you got it all out, you, nothing changed, but you felt so much better. Right. Yeah. Like, I had that moment too. Like I, I can't put a finger on what had changed. You know, I told you my first time I went to rehab, I was 26, actually probably not too far from Port Jervis, upstate New York, but I was 26. And the last time I had a drink, I was 31 and I was in and out for four years and it was just ugly and never put 90 days together in and out and fighting. And my sponsor had said recently, and it wasn't even referring to me, but he said we were engaged in a battle every single day of our lives and we didn't even know it. And I was like, holy shit, that was me, especially for, for that period of time that for those four years. And, but, you know, so I had the moment too, like I was sitting in my apartment, I was just drunk as a skunk. I, I say it's a Tuesday. I may, I'm not even sure, but only because it was just such a nothing night. And I was just all alone, you know, dr my shades drawn and drunk as a skunk all by myself. And I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I asked for help. And I remember thinking I had, I'm the, I'm the oldest grandchild of my mom's side. Mom's one of 10. I'm the first grandchild of like 20 something, you know, younger cousins. And they all looked up to me. And I remember thinking about them, like, is this, is this what you want them to see? You know, like yeah. worked in New York city, wall street. I played sports. Like they all looked, I know that they, they looked up to me. Right. And I love these guys and girls. And I remember thinking like, is this what you want them to see? You know, because I was teetering on like, not coming back, you know, no coming back, I guess. But, and it was something at that moment was different, but I hear it so many times. I heard my friend, Tim Logan on here, like, you know, he felt, he went to his knees and said, if there's a God, you know, show yourself. And next thing he turns around, he sees, you know, the, one of his best friends who had passed away, his dad is in this park and the guy's not supposed to be there. And yeah. says to him, son, I think I'm supposed to be here for you. And like, you just hear this stuff over and over and over again. And it sounds woo woo, right? But like when it's like a thousand for a thousand, like no bullshit, like, okay, like you got, I'm convinced, right? Like, yep. you know, when you said the, when the book got to you at that, you know, like, and it hits to you on, on the whole, what you're sitting in with your wife, it's just like, holy shit. Like, all right. You know, like, hold on here. Like enjoy the ride. Cause this is amazing. Buckle up. <laughs> buckle up. Yeah. Buckle up. You know, so you're telling your story and I'm like, wow, he's surrounded by such wisdom. But then you closed the story with, with your own wisdom, Mike. And I was like, look at this guy and look at where he's come and look at the clarity he has in his life. And that's, you know, I can't speak for you, but I'm pretty sure like you'll agree. Like clarity is not anything I had. I was, I had no fucking clue who yeah. I was, 
what I was. All I know I was going absolutely nowhere, no future at all. Me too. All those promises came true, you know, and I just came in, Mike, just because I didn't want to drink anymore. I couldn't drink anymore. I had no idea that I was going to completely change my life. Like I say it almost every episode. I try not to say it, but here it is again. You know, like when you walk into a meeting or to a rehab, like there's not this big, you know, banner. Like, Come on in, completely <laughs> change your life. You're going to walk <laughs> out of here and you're going to be in a few years. You're not going to realize it, but you're going to be in a completely different tra- trajectory. Your life's going to be a complete 180 from where it is right now. And that's exactly what happened to me and exactly what happened to you and exactly what happens to all of us. You know, and I think this is why I started this podcast. I wanted more yeah. people, you know, more people than the 20 or 30 people in the room need to hear these miracle redemption stories, you know? And I remember early on, like when I, my, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she had got me a book. I was struggling. And it was book was called courage to change. And it was a book of all like excerpts of like, I have it leaders or, or you have it. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. Pete Townsend's in there, yeah. and, you know, sober guys. I'm like, wow, these guys are sober too. Like, like I didn't know anything but, and, and, and it helped. Right. And then, you know, bouncing around New York city for, for when I lived in the city at the time, you know, all I did, Mike was go to, go to work and go to meetings. Like I had the pamphlet and that's all I had to do. And yeah. you start seeing some of these people in the meetings and you're sitting next to them and like, wow, these people are successful. And like you said, they're happy. You know, there was, I was in a group, it was called the Atlanta group and they had a softball team, Central Park. I love to play softball. And I was like, I'm going to go play softball in a sober league. Like I was playing, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, we call it the hangover league. You know, we get there and it was coolers of beer and those were in good days. You know, this is a sober, happy, you know, beautiful group of people and they're helping each other. And I, these are things that were, you know, they weren't part of my being, you know, you said gratitude, you write your gratitude list. I remember early on people saying, Hey, I'm, I'm a grateful al- alcoholic. I was like, <laughs> grateful. Al- uh, even so, so I'm talking about a few years. I'm like, yeah, I was like, okay, like g- give me a timeout, pal. All right. Like we're here. Great. We don't drink anymore, but I'm calling fucking bullshit. I'm grateful <laughs> alcoholic. Guess what? Just like all the other things on the wall. When they didn't make any sense, they start making sense to me that I am. A, I look you in the eye hundred percent. I'm a grateful alcoholic and I'm grateful because if I didn't go through what I went through, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be on this new path. Like you said, and the, the show's called, and I laughed about the name of your company, better beginning. I was like, you know, and this is the begin again podcast. Like we yeah. get to begin again and we get a new fresh start. You know, sometimes I feel like, man, I, I don't know if I even deserve this second chance. Like my wife, she jokes with me because I, I have so many out. I mean, these are on the good, outrageous, like ridiculous stories of chaos and just just ridiculous stories. And she's like, you've lived like so many times. She's like, but this, you know, this is obviously your your best path. But that's why we called it the begin again. We all get to yeah. begin again. And so, you know, we was- are blessed. Like, you know, the the biggest blessing is is that most people, you know, what I mean, like you live one life. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, I've heard people say like in recovery, oh, we get to live these two lives. And realistically, it's like we live three lives as mm-hmm. alcoholics and addicts because we live the life before the drink. Yeah. And then we live that life because something happened, you know, and I truly believe that reality is, is that, you know, it's not marijuana is the gateway drug. It's not alcohol is the gateway drug. Like for, I think many of us in the rooms, I think like trauma of some sort is the gateway, some sort of traumatic event triggers us to like get outside of that. And then we find the drink or the drug. So we live that life and then we get to live this life. Yeah. You know, and this in my estimation is like, is get in the mindset of your best days are still ahead of you. There. No matter fucking how old you are. No, I don't care how old you are. Your best days are still ahead of you. Even, even myself now, I need to continue to believe that my best days are still ahead of me. No matter what I've accomplished, my best days are still ahead of me because that keeps me living for today. Like no, do the best you can no. today. Do 100%. the best you can today, you know, and like, you'll continue to live a great life, you know, like uh, otherwise it's just like all of a sudden you get to this point. It's like, Oh, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Ah, I'm too old to do that. Bullshit. Bullshit. You know, Bullshit. never too old. Like, I think it's awesome. Like you said, like here, you started this podcast, like, we get to begin again. And that's kind of like where like better beginning now, like there's that saying the two best days to plant a tree are 20 years ago and today. Mm, that's Those are the right. two best days to plant a tree. 
So like when everybody is always saying, myself included, when it was like, oh, you know what? I'll go tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow. Fucking start right now. Yeah. Do something right now that can start to like that can start some momentum. Right. So like we can have a better beginning and we can have it right now. So like that's kind of like how that came about, like better beginning now. Like it's it's now like now is when we're living. It's right now that we live, not in the past, not in the future. The only moment in life that we're experiencing is right this moment. That's this is when we're living, right? Absolutely. Like everything else, it's either a memory or a fucking expectation, you know. So oh, yeah. like here is where we are. So like then I look at it that way, and it enables me to kind of like appreciate the days for what they are. Some days are full of fucking amazingness, you know, and other days are just humdrum. And I'll take those too, you know. And like I, I hate when people say things like, "Oh, you know what? That person's so lucky, or they're so lucky," you know, like. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as like that person must have been present em- enough, aware enough in the moment to seize an opportunity. Amen. And that's like what happens when we're present and we're aware. Most of the time in life, I was either living it like this, yep. you know, or like fucking in a daze. So there might have been lots of opportunities placed in front of me, but I didn't see them, right? Nor did yeah. I care to see them. But when we get recovery, when we get presence in our life, when we get that spirituality, going yes. we start to really see the things laid out before us now what are you going to do you know like i loved what you said about like you know you've heard you know all of these stories and there's this like you know you, some people like when they first hear it they're like oh it's kind of woo woo i'm sure because i personally used to believe that everything was a coincidence <laughs> and you can look at those things as coincidences if you want but when you fucking tie it all together, you're like, man, that's an awful lot of coincidences coming together to create that moment. Like too many coincidences for me, you know? So like, I just know my life is better when I do stay connected to a power greater than myself, to God, like, you know, however that looks yeah. for you, however that looks for anybody is great. You know what I mean? Like just understanding that there's more to this than me, right? Like being that ego driven self seeking selfish son of a bitch that I was thinking that I drove my life and my you know the world and I created all these things like this was me dude get out of your way yeah you know what I mean get oh, out yeah. of your way give it up like you think all those things happen because you did something yes you took some action you know and like I I said it to a guy yesterday I was like look and I firmly believe you know my god can move mountains you know, but if I think that I'm going to wake up in the morning and there's not a shovel sitting next to my bed that I need to pick up and I need to do the digging, then I'm just I'm just out of my mind because that is what's going to happen. He'll he will like God, your higher power, the universe, whatever you want to say, it, it will present opportunities in front of you your whole life. You got to pick up the shovel. Dude, I love you just said that because you you touched on things I say a lot. One I say often is there is no coincidences. I say that often because I really believe that. I really believe there's no coincidences. And you're talking about the shovel. You need to take the action, right? Like I say this a lot too. Like I can have a relationship with my higher power and I can say my prayers and be in gratitude and, you know, go about my day. But, you know, I got to look both ways when I come across in the street too, like you know, I got to make sure that the cars aren't coming. Like God's not just going to blind me, lead me through life. Right. Like I have a relationship with him today that, you know, I, beyond my wildest dreams, he starts and start my day with him, start my day on my knees in prayer. My prayers are, are built around gratitude as well, you know? And then I end my day in prayer as well. Thank you. We give me, cause it's, I started early on, you know, I start, please yeah. give me the gift of sobriety. That was my first prayer. Please give me the gift of sobriety today. And I went one day and I didn't drink. And I was like, holy shit, did that work? I didn't drink today. And I said, thank you for the gift of sobriety. I'm like, I'm going to try that again tomorrow. I mean, that's how fucking desperate I was at the time. Yeah. And I didn't drink the next day, you know? And um, I so I keep that with my my prayers. And now my prayers are evolving more. And I want them to keep evolving, you know, because we're all evolving. But they are revolved around gratitude, my prayers, and, and thanks to him and, you know, staying in the middle of the boat too, like staying in, yeah. in the middle, like don't get, I try not to get too high or I try not to get too low. Just try to stay right in the middle. But I say that with, uh, you know, a ton of ambition and tough, a ton of things that I want to do. And, I, and this is what I really, you know, what you're on, especially on your website. Like I am a firm believer, like I'm 49, my best years are ahead of me. Yeah. You know, like maybe it's just me being hard headed or I don't really care. Like I, I totally believe that from the bottom of my heart. Right. And so, 
I can't wait for, you know, but it's a day at a time. And you yeah. said, you got to live today is, and I love what you said about where our feet are and not to back up again either, but uh, what you said about trauma, like if you had said that a few years ago, I wasn't, again, this is like a, it's a newer topic, but I was watching like Gabor Monte, yeah, you know, yeah. and he's in Vancouver and one of the, one of the worst areas in the, uh, in the at least North America, as far as drug addiction. And it's a hundred percent, all of them that are addicted have, have gone through some sort of childhood trauma, a hundred percent. That's not to say that everyone that does go through childhood trauma is, is going to become an alcoholic or an addict, but it's saying, he is saying that everyone that is alcoholic or an addict with what, without a doubt has dealt with childhood trauma. And I'm one of them, even though like at some level, I, at yeah. some level, and yep. it's relative, like my childhood trauma or your child could, you know, could be, you don't compare them. It doesn't matter. You're talking about kids here, You're talking about young Correct. brains at work. Right. So it doesn't matter like what the event is or what you're going through. But again, this is stuff, you know, I didn't know what it, what that was until, you know, fairly recently, certainly in, in recovery, like, you know, you know, PTSD, if you will, like you know, I, I was a nervous wreck my whole entire life because of things I saw, or I didn't think my dad was going to make it home or, you know, whatever it was. And so I totally agree with everything. You just, I, I think you're a hundred percent right that, you know, that's yeah. Listen, I'm not an advocate for any of that stuff for drinking or, or weed or whatever it may be, but I think I totally agree with you at the, at the, yeah. at the core of it is childhood trauma. You I know, think, and I love what you said there. Like, and it's not about comparing like, well, her, his trauma was worse than mine or my trauma was worse than his because the reality is, is that you are dealing with children. Yes. So we don't get to determine what traumatic event, how it affects that person. The fact right. of the matter is, is that it did in a way that it changes the trajectory of the way that they think and feel. And you can carry that straight through, right? You can oh, carry yeah. that until you don't. So it's not about exactly what happened. It's about that something happened and it affected them deeply. Yes. Now, like, And there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, you know what? They didn't go through what I went through. Like, why is it affecting them so badly? That's not for fucking you to say. Right. It's not up to you. You yeah. don't get to say how it affected them. The fact of the matter is, is that it did. Yeah. So like until that person, myself included, until I was ready to look at what was affecting me until that person is willing to take a look at, yes, this is what affected me. How did it affect me? Why did it affect me that way? And what other behaviors in my life has it carried through in? Yeah. Until we can deal with that, then like that's when like real good stuff starts to happen. Yeah. Is when we can really that's start true. to let go of that, especially because we're children and they're chill like you like 99.999% of the time it wasn't your fault. I know, I know. And, and that's the th told. that's the thing to let go of is the guilt and the shame and carrying it ourselves. Like right. saying, like, you know, but like, dude, you were nine, you know, oh, I you know. were eleven, you were fourteen. Like it it doesn't like it's how is that for you to carry that burden, you know, for somebody else's you know, for something else that happened. So you know? and it's so like true. uh yeah, I think it's I, I don't think it's and I know personally, like it wasn't really talked about as much when I first came into recovery and, you know, like 15 years ago, like I didn't hear that. It's right, more, yeah. it's like, like this new these days. Yes. Because more and more people are starting to like, kind of like see, like there's, there's this mental, which we know, like I have a mental obsession. That's the difference between alcoholism, like somebody that just drinks too much, you know, like yeah. I have a mental obsession. Yeah. Once it starts, Ooh, it's going crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, to me, like, that's what my sponsor explained to me in the beginning was like, look, this is, this is a, this isn't, you know, your alcohol is just a, you know, it's merely a symptom. Like right. you got other shit going on. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? What yeah. do you mean? It's just a symptom. Like I, I'm not drinking anymore. I should be yeah. good. Right. He's like, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. you have this, like, you know, it's, it's the thoughts that create feelings and the feelings that are going to like actually initiate the actions that I take. So like, I got to get my thoughts, right. My thoughts are right. Then my feelings will be good. And then I'm going to be able to take the better action. Right. You know, when my thoughts are all fucked, my feelings are twisted and I'm just going to react. I'm not going to respond. I'm going to react because yeah. that's what I was good at. I was good at reacting. You know, you push me against the wall. Here we go. Right. Yeah. You know? And what you're saying too, and I'm, you know, speaking for myself, you know, 
uh, is those thoughts and feelings or my self-esteem or zero self-esteem or oh. constantly feeling less than or anxious and scared and fear inside is because of that initial childhood trauma. And, you know, some of us, it's been, it was years of, of this, of this trauma, right. And our, again, we didn't, this, it's more talked about now, you know, like yeah. this was enlightening to me, you know, and it also had to be told to me, you know, forget about like the actual term childhood trauma. Like it had to be like, like that movie, like uh, the movie Goodwill Hunting, like when he, he's talking to uh, Robin Williams, right? And and Robin Williams finally breaks him down. He's like, dude, it's not your fault. And he's like, no, no, I know, I know. And he goes, no, no, no. It's not your fault. And he, you know, he hits him. Right? And I'm yeah. even filling up and now thinking about it because I related so much to that scene in my life. I really did. And remember like sponsors, my girlfriend is my wife at the time. Like she, I shared only the stuff with her. Like it was just me and her. And I didn't share it. Anybody else, you know, it was so hard for me, even in sobriety to finally like, you know, I was like, man, how am I going to write this stuff down? How am I going to share this stuff with them? Like, you know, I don't want to rat anybody out. Like, I don't want to get, you know, like, I don't, I, we don't talk about this stuff. And lo and behold, just like everything in that book, when I did what I was told to do in the instruction manual, the big book, things changed for me, you know? And yeah. I, I, one other thing he said about the mental obsession, like I thought for sure, I was like, there's no way that mental obsession is ever going to leave this brain. Like I really didn't think it was. And it dawned to me one day, you know, in recovery, I was like, holy shit. I don't have the, the mental obsession to drink has been lifted from me. Like yeah. it really has. And again, it's yeah. like, oh my God, it's amazing. It really is. Yeah. But um, dude, what a conversation. I love speaking with you, but really quick. How do you yeah. pivot from this, you know, beautiful story? How do you pivot or... How do you, maybe it's not the word, maybe pivot's the wrong word, but how do you get to the point where I'm going to do this for a living? I'm going to start helping people. So it kind of like just came about like mm -hmm. really like I was in the restaurant business for like 20 years, COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, it really is a pivot because like, you know, like COVID hit, um, my catering business was like sideways because I couldn't do anything. I had like $300,000 worth of lost revenue for the year. Mm -hmm. And the next year, like, you know, there are people that kind of pushed out their dates and it was just like, it was just a lot of shit. You know, I was just yeah. like, oh man, I didn't want to be tied to that. So I was like doing some reading, you know, at the time. And then I kind of started following like Jay Shetty. Yeah. Um, and I really got into like his stuff. And then he had this coaching program. So I took the life coaching program and then I went down, you know, and then somebody like, you know, just online kind of made this suggestion, like, Hey, you should be like a, like a recovery coach and stuff. And I didn't even know that existed at the time. So I took like the New York state, like, you know, I became like, you know, a peer advocate, you know, certified recovery coach. And then like, it just kind of was something I was like, you know what, maybe I can do this like within like rehabs and stuff. And then I kind of like, just followed it, you know? And I just like, and there's like, look, it, 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 it will continually evolve, yeah. right? It's gone from like, just wanting to kind of like carry this message to more people to like, be able to work with people in like the recovery aspect of things. I've always helped people in recovery. Like I, that's my sobriety is like, yeah. is being able to help other people I still, you know, like sponsorship is still a part of my recovery. And then like kind of making this more of like, you know, how can, you know, how can I reach more people you know, and at first it was like, you know, I wanted to do like coaching. And so I've done coaching, but like now I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like pulling away from like the coaching aspect of things like, you know, like doing like one-on-one -on -one coaching, you know, what I really want to see, like where I foresee, like, you know, so we're getting to the end of a year, yeah, got ideas for the coming year. Sure. And there are a lot of things that I want to do that will happen because I will continue to take actionable steps towards them. How soon they'll happen. I don't know. That's not up to me. You know, like Sada Guru once said, like, it stuck with me. You know, people say like, you know, this whole world says things like, you know, anything is possible. Anything is possible. He goes, no, 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 no. What is possible and what is not possible is not up to you. Mm -hmm. That's the universe's business. That is not your business. What is your business is seeing what way, getting clear on where you want to go and then continuing to move forward towards that. Yes. And if it is meant to be, it will be but that is not up to you when and where it'll happen. So I like that because like, like you said, I didn't have clarity in my life in the past. I do have clarity now. I do know which direction I want to go. I do know what I want to see happen, how it unfolds. I don't know. I get like, that's what keeps me going. 
is just, I enjoy doing what I do. So like where I would like to, like, there are some things that I want to do in the coming year. Like what I would really like to do is like, I love hoodies, you know, I like hats. I mean, like I wear them all the time. Like it's who I, it's what I like to do. I live in Vegas right now. So like, it's a little different. Like now I can wear hoodies. Cause like, to me, like 50 degrees is freezing now. Cause like, you know, <laughs> I'm used to it being like, you know, but you know, in the summertime, not wearing hoodies, but like, I have like this idea of, you know, I also do things in the online space too. Like I work with, you know, I have, I'm a part owner with like a media agency. Like, so, you know, we kind of do like a lot of online, um, we, we run ad campaigns and stuff for, mm -hmm. for people. So like I see what's possible and I know what's possible. So like, I want like a recovery kind of base, but it doesn't have to shout out like things like this, but yeah. just some of the things that we say, yeah. some of these things that we say that just, I've said things to people that are like just regular, normal human beings that are drinkers. And like, you say these like things that we hear like, wow, it's so profound. Yeah. Where did you get that? I got in the fucking room of AA. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. ever come sit in a meeting for a while. You'll hear all kinds of profound shit. You will. No you know doubt. what I mean? No so like doubt. I have these, like, you know, there's, there's, I, I want to have like a clothing line for better beginning. Now I'm going to be doing like some, like I want to do like sober recovery retreat vacations. I want people yeah. to realize that, yo, you can do amazing, fun, cool shit, sober with mm -hmm. other sober people you know, network and connect with these people. So like I have like, we're working on a new website. We're going to be like, kind of like launching that, like as we get into the new year, it'll really be pushing like, you know, kind of like probably two like recovery vacation retreats per year, um, getting a clothing line going. And then the big, big thing, like my big goal, like my ultimate goal is to have a couple of like sober, like recovery, not just sober, but recovery retreat centers mm -hmm. where people like not just myself can host a retreat there, but like anybody can come to me that like someone like yourself or other coaches or other people that have programs and say, look, you know, I deal with people that have suffered from, you know, abuse or blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, I'm putting together this retreat and I'm like, okay, you know, do you want to use the mountain retreat or do you want to use the retreat on yes. the beach? And they can have like 12, 15 people come to this place, you know, like, and so that's the ultimate goal is to have a couple of love that places, you know, that'll be like, you know, this is a place where you can start a better beginning now, like, you know, like, and they can come together really and, and places for families to go and heal and stuff too, because that's the thing people don't talk about enough think in recovery is like you know the addicts and the and the alcoholics you know like we have this support network and there are support networks for people that are family members of but i i think that more and more people need to realize that like everybody's affected by this disease everybody's no affected by addiction and those people that are the ones that are not the alcoholics that are not the addicts need support as well you know and like I think it's important, you know what I mean? And the more people that get involved in a healing process, the better it's going to be for everybody. No doubt. You know, it's funny. Uh, well, it's not funny. I shouldn't say, but you say that, right? And because when, when I started the podcast, it's like, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just for all of us that are in recovery or trying to get sober because like, it's like 0 0.5 degrees of separation, right? Of people that, you know, either are in it or are recovered or know someone, probably a loved one, aunt, uncle, cousin, friend, a friend of a friend. It's it's really uh it's a lot less than six degrees separation. Let's put it that way. So, you know, there's so much to that, right? And there's I have ideas too, and we'll talk about them offline yeah. too about things and you know, about lessening the stigma, right? And yeah. so it doesn't have to be, you know, again, we'll talk offline, but you know, it doesn't have to be just just this amazing, which is an amazing community that you and I are in right now, which is, you know, this has been the best part about like starting this podcast, man, is the amazing people that I'm continuing to meet. And like, it's been the most fun. Like that wasn't on their business plan, if you will, either. Like, yeah, exactly. Meet so yeah. many cool people along the way, but Hey man, we are here to support better beginning now from start to, f there is no finish from here on out because, uh, you know, now we're in the we're brothers now. Uh, I'm going to put, we'll put all your stuff, all, all your links will be on the show notes, but please tell the audience, where can we find you? 
So right now, like mostly just the main place that I hang out is on Instagram, you know, mm -hmm. like it's, and it's at better beginning now. Like that's my, you know, that's my tag. Um, please, you know, follow along if it's not something that, you know, you're into or whatever, like share it with somebody that you think might, you know, benefit from it. Um, never there to offend anybody. You know what I mean? I'm just there to carry like my message. And like, if that resonates with you, by all means, like love to love to chat. Um, LinkedIn page will be getting going, you know, a little bit. I kind of just started dabbling around with that, like putting it together. Mm -hmm. And then on Facebook too, we do have a Facebook community. Um, you can search it at better beginning now request to be, you know, entered in and like, you know, as long as you kind of meet the criteria, I'd love to have you, you know, part of that too. Um, you, know, you can, our website is www.betterbeginningnow.com. So uh, yeah, and that'll be changing over the course of the, you know, it'll be, it'll be kind of neat if you check it out now. And then kind of see like, you know, like watch the involvement of it. Yeah. That's really what this is all about. Like I, I truly believe, you know, I went to uh Tony Robbins event um, last month, the Unleashed Power Within event. It was amazing, yeah. by the way, I'll be the, again, I'll be there again next year. I'll be doing some other things there as well. Lots of amazing people. And the big thing like about it is, you know, he says it and I truly resonate and agree with this. Like everybody thinks that our purpose in life is to be happy. Our purpose in life is to grow. Mm -hmm. That is our purpose in life. Our purpose yeah. in life is to grow and to continually grow. And if you continually grow, the byproduct of that will be happiness. I so it's, you know, like that's kind of like, so you'll kind of see like, we're going to continue to try to grow. I want to continue to try to touch as many people as I possibly can. And like you said, if it just touches one person today, fucking home run. It's a win. It's a grand, it's a, it's a grand slam win, man. That's a yep. good day right there. It's a walk off. It's a walk it's a off. Walk off. No, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt, man. You know, that's Derek Jeter final game, New York, you know, at Yankee Stadium. That How did he? I was there. My were my son really? and I were at the game. Oh, oh yeah. man. Any a walk off. Walk off. I mean, like the guy, it's a storybook ending. Story you know, book. so couldn't yeah. possibly write it up any better. See, that place was absolutely electric my buddy i have was never there. been it was amazing i was, was i was there in, texting me and yeah uh, section 106 that's where we were sitting it was unreal so funny my buddy he texted me he was at the game and right i think he had a i don't know if he had a homer early but he got a hit early put him up and then they tied it up and he's like oh that was where he would have he would have got the game winner i just you know I said, don't worry, he's gonna win it and he's gonna walk it off in extras. I said to him. So every time I see him, he's like, You freaking called that. It was that amazing. Derek Jeter? That was an easy one to call. Yeah. It's Derek Jeter. You know Derek what I mean? Jeter. Like it's Derek Jeter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, well listen, Gary, man, this has been a pleasure. pleasure. I really appreciate it. Pleasure's been all mine. We're gonna do this again too. All right. Especially yeah, absolutely. rocking and rolling uh, later in maybe second half or mid year. Uh, we're gonna do this again, bud. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for your message. It's really important, bud. Thank you very much. God bless, buddy. Thank you for tuning in to another powerful episode of the Begin Again podcast. We sincerely appreciate your time and support. We hope that today's conversation has ignited a spark within you, affirming that recovery is not only attainable, but can also be a wellspring of strength and resilience. Our ultimate goal is to make a difference in someone's life every single day. By sharing these stories of redemption, we strive to empower you and inspire you to unlock your fullest potential, facilitate positive transformations, and contribute to creating a better future for yourself, for your loved ones, and the world at large. If you know someone who could benefit from listening to our show, please share it with them. And if you resonate with our mission and feel compelled to do so, we would greatly appreciate your support through a five-star review following us on Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, The Begin Again Podcast. The more positive reviews we receive and the wider our message spreads, the greater our collective ability to help others realize that change is possible in their own lives. Thank you once again for being a part of our community. May you be blessed on your own journey of personal growth and transformation.